regarded as you witness to sign the financial, the final solution for Enya, the so-called resolution to Enya. Today is a day that we took an important step towards a secure future for the vulnerable 30,000 plus policyholders whose pensions are threatened to be significantly cut, which would have severe social and economic consequences. Today, after months of discussions, research, and planning, we reached to the resolution of Enya, based on cooperation with our, within our kingdom. Our first attempt to come to a resolution included the Netherlands, who were willing to provide a major loan to be used as a capital injection for a full restart of Enya. After lots of efforts, this first attempt did not succeed, as the proposed loan would be a heavy burden to the budgets with severe debts which will result, especially for Curacao, to exceed the interest burden norm of the Kingdom Act financial supervision Curacao and St. Martin, the so-called NFT, which would not be only a violation of the NFT, but could potentially jeopardize the future capital investments, as was earlier mentioned by the Prime Minister. After this first attempt, Curacao, St. Martin, and the Central Bank went back to the drawing board to find an alternative, alternative solution in the interest of the policyholders of Enya, after a period of long discussions and negotiations, we finally reached an agreement that we can celebrate today. St. Martin, Curacao, and the Central Bank showed with continued efforts and collaboration to be able to come to a fin financial, solid, and sustainable solution to the Enya policyholders and the countries. Through which solution, the pensions of the pension holders would no longer be threatened to be cut and Curacao and St. Martin secured sufficient space for necessary future capital investments. Today, I'm here to ratify the resolution to Enya, but I'm also here to say farewell to my fellow ministers of Curacao as I return home, as when I return home, I return home soon to be a member of parliament. This makes me to reflect on my last four years of being minister of finance, which period was for sure not the easiest period due to the recovery of the hurricane and the COVID pandemic, which wrecked our economies, and of course the geopolitical matters at times fighting for our respect, our sovereignty, and honest cooperation with the Netherlands. The beginning of this journey tested us all on different fronts, spiritually and physically. But today, we can look back and say that we have built a stronger relationship as kingdom partners that led to the success today. Honest cooperation within the kingdom makes us strong and able to resolve anything. And I hope to see this cooperation not just continue, but grow in the best interest of the countries, especially cooperation between Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin. I would like to thank all of those that participated in this assignment, the advisors at Central Bank, the advisors of Curacao, but also my staff, Christian and Yap from the cabinet. And I also would like to thank the population of both countries for their time and having patience and believing in both of these governments during this time. I think we did a great job with what we were faced with. I'm happy to be able to serve to my best abilities to make our future and today's event, the future of the policyholders much brighter. Thank you. Prime Minister, take into consideration the fact that you're preparing to leave office. Is there this one thing in the pipeline that you would have loved to achieve that you did not? If yes, what is this one thing? One thing would be, I can't give you one thing, Stephen, but I know for sure one of the things that is still pending which can happen or it might happen with the next government is what was initiated in terms of the improvements for our civil servants um, requires legislation as i mentioned before it was at the council of advice the main one for the changes and i know everyone is asking when will we finally see that increment on our salaries the civil servants so of course i'd like to have that finalized um, and so we are looking forward in fact i got a message just last evening uh, this morning, you know, where is it and how far and when we do we expect this to happen? Of course, the legislation that requires to go to Parliament will have to go. But the other is a national decree where general measures would then be signed off by Governor and myself. 
if those are achieved before a new transition, I will be very happy. But even if it happens in the next government, I'm still happy because it's a decision that it's a process. It was taken um, in due time. I would like to see all of the other discussions that we had with our unions um, come to fruition because government is on the same page with them in terms of improving the conditions for our civil service, not just in remuneration, but in working environment and the like. Another thing that has weighed heavily on me is, of course, um, the situation with the SER. And we are still trying to actively resolve the impasse because of the employers association, the dispute, and the ILO recommendations. Um, hopefully, that will be resolved within the next couple of weeks uh, so that the necessary legislation that impacts St. Martin can be handled. That is something that has been pending now since last year, June. And despite our best efforts as government, um, a lot of times our, our passion to solve this problem has been used against us. And though we have positive verdicts in our court of law, an ILO recommendation still blocks a, a large segment of society, uh, business representatives from being a part of the SER. Um, we are seeking a solution and barring that solution being found, we will make do with what we have because sitting in this function, I've realized that we have to take tough decisions in tough times, but we have to look at the greater good of the population and hopefully the many egos that are impacted by the impasse or that are causing the impasse will reflect on this and see the greater, um, the greater good of our community in getting the SER up and running. A lot of what I have championed here, um, that growth fund, signing those agreements, because that was always said was a, a pipe dream and that we would never get access to those funds. Of course, I would like to be the signatory on those agreements. But as long as St. Martin can sign those agreements, then I am proud for St. Martin because it's not about me. It's about the people of St. Martin. And when I move over 100% to the Parliament of St. Martin, I get to hold the government accountable for all those decisions that we made in the interest of the people of St. Martin and to ensure continuity. There is a lot, a lot of legislation that needs to be upgraded. And for me, those are the priorities that any government coming in will have to focus on because government is continuity. And I want to ensure that the hardworking civil servants do not become disheartened and demotivated moving forward because of maybe a change in trajectory and a stagnation of progress that have finally been made. SV insured? Do you have a valid medical insurance status? SV is cardless. Request your My SV account today and enter the virtual office of SV. Go to SV.SX and sign up now. SV, yeah. your social and health insurance. I've traveled all over the world. How many people have heard of Michael Jackson before? I used to work with Michael Jackson. I'm gonna show you a few things while I'm here today. 
And again, Michael left a history of dance videos and art behind so you could enjoy it. I, when I was your age, I dreamed of working with him. And as a young adult, I got to work with him. There's a saying, sit with winners. The conversation is different. Does that make sense? Yes or yes? yes. <laughs> sit with winners. The conversation is different. Sit with people who have vision and focus. Do I have permission to teach you a quick lesson? Yes, yes. okay. Who wants this? Who wants this? Who wants this? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. What's your name? Her name is Rihanna. I want you to listen, 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 listen. This is one of the most important lessons you will ever learn in your life. Listen to it. I asked five times who wants it. Stand there one second, Rihanna. What's your name? Savion, come on up. Savion approached it. And then he said, uh, he came over and then he gave up. Right? He came and then he gave up. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He didn't want to be rude and snatch it. That's why he doesn't have it. In life, listen. I never said there was rules and regulation. All I did was hold it up. I said, who wants it? Whoever would have come and gotten it deserves it. Thank you. In life, listen to this. Remember what I told you, the most important thing or lesson that you will hear today. In life, you don't get what you want. You get what you go out and get. The reason that Rihanna has the money in her pocket is because she decided to get up, she decided to go all the way, and decided to grab it. That's why she has it. Everybody in here, everybody, if you don't do that in life, you're gonna be behind the person who does. So what inspired me to bring Darren Hansen to St. Martin? Actually, he reached out to my company, Blue Horizon, whereas um, once he asked um, if St. Martin would be interested in his book tour, um, that was a no-brainer, and I told him, of course. So I contacted um, the Tourism Bureau to see how we could collaborate and assist. And um, with that, I found that with his talents, being an actor, choreographer, author, dancer, I thought it was best to also um, have him come to Charlotte Brooks and as a guest speaker. As the only performing arts school here on St. Martin, having uh, Mr. Darren uh, DeWitt Henson with us um, is an awesome, was an awesome experience. Um, for, for our students, um, being a, a school that, 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 that thrives on, on creativity, um, it allows our students to know, hey, it is possible for them. Um, you know, uh, performing arts is still, or performing arts education is still a new concept here on St. Martin. Um, but, you know, the kids, seeing them, uh, 
I've seen that exchange between the students and, and, and Mr. Henson and the excitement that it brought. It was very rewarding and um, it was an, uh, an awesome experience for me as the director, just seeing how excited they were. And um, I think this is why uh, an institution such as ours um, needs to exist, why it's important for us to exist and why um, persons such as Mr. Henson, um, we welcome them um, to, uh, to, to CBA, um, to, to speak to our students, to motivate our students, and to allow them to see that it's possible for them as well. What inspired me to write the book was a lot of questions that a lot of my fans all over the world ask, and I can't be everywhere at one time, but a book can. So I decided to put all the answers in the book. The difference between this book and my other books is that this book has a collection and a combination of all of the books together. My first book, Intimate Thoughts in the Spirit of Change, uh, is a poetic story. Uh, my book, Ain't That the Truth, is a book of daily positive affirmations and pregnant with thought was a book that expounds on the way we can create and the magnetism of that. And Life's Teachable Moments is a collection of all of them. But I believe that this book is very profound because the people who have used it have been able to bring their goals to them and manifest them 20 times, 30 times faster than they ever did before just by using the information in the book. What I sincerely would like people to take away after reading my book, Life's Teachable Moments, is a choice to take action with their lives. If you want massive change in your life, take massive action. If you want a little change in your life, take a little change, but remove procrastination from your life, make a decision and move forward and it will change your life. And that's what I want people to be the takeaway of life's teachable moments, because it is, it is a teachable moment every day of your life. Being back in St. Martin after 15 years has, has really been very dynamic and this is why I got to meet the youth this time. I got to work with the youth this time. I got to talk to the youth this time. I normally speak and engage with adults all the time, but this time it was a, a great polarity of the youth, which I believe needed to hear my voice. And of course, my peers, the elders um, on the island. And so this time I feel a full spectrum. I feel that there was a, uh, a great synergy between both groups that I think will echo and make a difference. O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. The former football great rose to infamy following the 1994 slayings of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. He was accused of the murders but ultimately acquitted following a lengthy trial. Simpson's family released a statement on social media today reading in part, our father Orenthal James Simpson succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children 
and his grandchildren. And we're told that he died yesterday. NBC's Cynthia McFadden covered the O.J. Simpson trial extensively, which captivated the nation. It was known as the trial of the century. Just a stunning development in a life that started with this football great. He won the Heisman Trophy at USC, was an NFL star playing largely for the Buffalo Bills for so many years, and then came the trial and ultimately serving prison time for an armed robbery. What are you thinking right now? Well, I'm thinking that this was a life that spanned both the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Uh, having sat in that courtroom for the entire 11-month criminal trial and then the subsequent civil trial in which the Goldman family uh, sued him uh, for, for money damages, uh, which were never made good on. Uh, some of the payments were made, but very, very little of the payments were ever made. You know, O.J. Simpson was um, a larger-than-life person who... Um, succumbed, I think, to the very worst instincts that he had. And um, he, while he was acquitted of the criminal trial, the evidence, if, as you sat in the courtroom, was just a mountain of evidence, the blood evidence, the evidence piled up against him. And yet the acquittal, the jury, I think one of the things that was interesting at the time, the jury, of course, saw a much different set of facts and what the, the those of us sitting in the courtroom saw. Much was excluded, much was changed. There were the famous, uh, the glove, if, if it doesn't fit, it must acquit, you know, you must acquit. The defense team, um, you know, outlawed the prosecution in many ways. Um, and it was a, it was a stunning, uh, the day of the verdict, I will never forget. I think we went in thinking that there was going to be a conviction, uh, and it was an acquittal. Um, he was convicted in this civil case where the standard, of course, is lower. Right. He was found liable in the civil case where, of course, it's a preponderance of the evidence versus yes. the reasonable doubt. And we do have to remember, before we even had the trial, we had the Bronco chase, which is just this moment in history that every single person remembers this low-speed Bronco chase through Los Angeles carried live on television. Yeah. Remember, it, it, the murder, of course, uh, occurred on June 12, 1994, uh, went quickly to trial. The, the Bronco case was this. I mean, it's one of those things, if you were alive at that point, you probably remember where you were when that Bronco chase occurred. Uh, and, uh, you know, Simpson, uh, the, they went to court very quickly. I mean, when we know now, there are sometimes years of delay. In this case, uh, well, they went to court in November. The, the crime committed in June. They went to court in November. The verdict was in October of, of 95. We are just two months away now from marking 30 years since those murders, June 12th, 1994. <laughs>
session seeks to provide participants with an understanding of the challenges and opportunities associated with transitioning to a climate resilient, sustainable, low carbon future with a specific focus on renewable energy. During virtual addresses, local and ILO officials highlighted the importance of the talks. These conversations are necessary to the local, regional and international level. Therefore, over the next three days, I encourage you to delve into the issues, opportunities and challenges associated with just transition. Certainly, the answer does not rest with any one individual, any one sector or entity. Just transition means different things to different people in different spaces. However, in concerning just transition, we must have a holistic approach. Events such as this national symposium embody the essence of collaboration, social partnership, knowledge exchange, and integrative policy development. And I again echo the, the call by Honorable Minister Adrian Ford for us to see if we can make this an annual event. And Labor Minister Colin Jordan has elaborated on the impacts of climate change on the workforce. We've seen it in Dominica not too long ago, where in about 12 hours, over 100% of the nation's GDP was wiped out. That impacts workers because it means that stores are shut. It means that manufacturing plants are shut. Those are the negative impacts. We have to build resilience. We have to adapt. And that has to be our focus. It means then that there's going to be the need for flexibility. Businesses and employers have to be flexible. Workers will have to be flexible because we are transitioning. We are in a transition. From a government perspective, we're going to do all that we can to make sure that the transition is just. Over the next few days, sessions on opportunities for job creation and regional best practices, among other things, will be rolled out. The talks are scheduled to wrap up on April 12th. Rianne Phillips, CBC News.